What's worse than stepping in cat barf in your socks? The GeForce FX series. What's worse than the GeForce FX series in general? The GeForce FX 5200 specifically. <laughs> By now, it's a bit of a broken record to say that the GeForce FX series wasn't a great line of graphics cards, and the worst defender of the lot would easily be the lowly FX 5200. In my previous video on that card, it was even seen being bested by budget graphics cards from the previous generation. But admittedly, I chose the worst possible scenario, an example with the lowest clocks and a 64-bit memory interface. The response from some was that the FX 5200 is capable of much more, and that my take on it was misleading or even disingenuous. Well, let's give it the best chance possible then. Let's see how well the fastest NB34 based card can do with a GeForce FX 5200 Ultra. Will it see redemption? I guess we'll find out. This is Pixel Pipes. The FX series has among the widest ranges of products of any graphics card series to date. When it launched in 2003, the high-end cards were quickly accompanied by lower-end offerings in both the mainstream and budget categories. For around $200, you had the 5600 Ultra, and its cheaper non-Ultra counterpart, which compared to the 5900 series, sacrificed one texture unit in each pipe and cut the memory interface in half. Pretty standard stuff. The 5200 cards gave up much more. In addition to the 5600's cutbacks, the 5200 also ditched Z buffer compression and color compression. What this means is that the memory bandwidth of the card is much less effective, being wasted on tons of uncompressed data. And of course, the 5200 Ultra also comes at a lower core clock compared to its 5600 sibling. Compared to a regular 5200, however, the 5200 Ultra gains a sizable 30% higher core clock and a huge 62.5% higher memory clock. Next to my bare bones 5200 in particular, this gives it 3.25 times the memory bandwidth, which is absolutely massive and desperately needed given its limitations. Both the 5200 Ultra and the 5600 Ultra required separate Molex power connectors, which is honestly a little crazy for mainstream and budget cards of any time period, especially since its main competition at the time, the Radeon 9200 and 9600 Pro, required no additional power. Although it should be noted, the 9600 Pro generally lacked backwards compatibility with older AGP 2X slots. So here's the breakdown for our comparison today. We're going to pit the 5200 Ultra up against the original 64-bit 5200 from the previous video, and we'll also downclock it to the same speeds to simulate a 128-bit 5200. We're also going to compare it to the GeForce 4 TI4200 as there's some debate online over which card is faster. I can already guess, but I'll let the benchmarks do the talking. We'll also include a subset of the NVIDIA cards from the lineup in the previous video, and for the first time we'll include the MX460 for a total of 8 cards tested across 8 benchmarks. Please see the video description for card specs and test system details. In 3 d Mark 2001, the TI4200 enjoys a strong lead of 29% over the 5200 Ultra, but the Ultra is no slouch, beating the TI500 and managing to improve upon the 64-bit 5200 with more than two times the performance. It's even 47% faster than the 128-bit version. 
3D Mark III sees the 5200 Ultra actually leading the chart against the TI-4200, largely thanks to its ability to run the Pixel Shader 2.0 test Mother Nature, and the subsequent score bonus that that gives it. For the same reason, the 128-bit 5200 edges close to the TI-500, though nothing can save the 64-bit version from sinking to the bottom. Quake 3 gives another strong showing for the 5200 Ultra, with only a 10% margin separating it from the venerable TI-4200. The non-Ultra 5200s perform unremarkably relative to their competition, being bested by all but the MX440. For the first time, we're testing Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which offers a more strenuous test using the same id Tech 3 engine as before. And once again, the 5200 Ultra trails behind the TI-4200 by 8%, a slightly smaller distance from the previous test. Surprisingly, this game doesn't seem to be that much more stressful for these cards than Quake 3, despite being released two years later and pushing the engine with more detail. The second encounter isn't kind to the 5200 Ultra, with even the TI-500 besting it by 11%, and the humble TI-200 even sneaks in fairly close. It does perform 59% faster than the 128-bit 5200 at least, with the bottom feeder 5200 turning in truly mediocre results. The TI-4200 goes on a KILLING SPREE in Unreal Tournament 2004, absolutely trashing every other card on the chart. It beats the 5200 Ultra by exactly 50%, and all the rest of the cards are huddled close together behind it. Both vanilla 5200s perform the worst, being beat by even the MX440, despite the fact that the MX card only has 64 MB of memory, which UTO4 handily exceeds at my settings. Half-Life 2 shows both the TI-4200 and TI-500 beating the 5200 Ultra, just like in Serious Sam. And with few other cards on the list, the vanilla 5200s share last place once again. The MX460 and 440 had to sit this one out, as although Half-Life 2 will run on them, not having support for any shader effects whatsoever means they aren't fighting fair in DirectX 7 mode. Doom 3, however, pushes every card to its limit, even with low settings and a vintage VGA resolution selected. The 5200 Ultra gets close to the 4200 thanks to its Ultra Shadow technology, which mitigates some of the penalties inflicted by not having most memory bandwidth saving technologies available to it. Even the 128-bit 5200 does pretty well here, eyeing up the TI-500 which sits just above it. And hey, for the first time in this video, the 64-bit 5200 isn't at the bottom. A round of applause for its achievement here. So in all but one test, the GeForce 4 TI-4200 beats the 5200 Ultra, and this is likely due to the 4200 having twice as many texture units in each of its four pipes. This is despite having 21% less memory bandwidth though, and it doesn't even require an external power connector. The 5200 Ultra and all cards based on the NV34 are simply held back too much by the exclusion of lossless color compression and Z-buffer compression, so all its bandwidth is wasted on uncompressed data. To compensate, NVIDIA pushed the clocks higher, which means it consumes more power than a TI-4200 as both GPUs are built on the same 150 nanometer process. The 5200 Ultra averaged 47.7% faster than the 128-bit 5200, and a whopping 102% faster than the 64-bit 5200 that I tested previously. The 128-bit card averaged 36.1% faster than the 64-bit card, which goes to show how starved for memory bandwidth it is when clocks and other factors are equal. Overall, the three cards showed pretty significant scaling between each other. The 64-bit 5200 was a terrible card in its day for playing modern games at the time of its release. I still stand by that assertion, as well as the fact that many 5200 cards being sold were misleadingly marketed as being the same, despite potentially having as little as half the memory bandwidth, and that's something I feel contributes to its poor reputation. But there's no denying that having a 128-bit memory interface made all the difference in the world. And if you step back from the games of the time period, you can get some excellent performance in those older titles. The 5200 Ultra is in another league entirely though, and while it wasn't as popular a seller as the cheaper models, it could actually play some of the new games released in 2003 and even 2004 if you backed off the settings enough. 
but that doesn't change the fact that Pixel Shader 2.0 effects were basically unusable on the card. And if you had to run games in DirectX 8 mode anyway, you might as well have bought a TI-4200 with 128 MB of memory, as it would have easily performed better at a similar price point and wouldn't have even needed a spare Molex connector from your power supply. So, redemption? Well, I'm sure opinions will differ, but in my mind the 5200 Ultra still wasn't fast enough to justify its existence over previous generation cards. NVIDIA's goal with the 5200 series was to give all gamers the chance to have DirectX 9 compatibility at any price point. And while that's commendable, it would have helped if budget cards could actually use it with any real speed. The next generation, NVIDIA would try to repeat the success of the 5200 with the GeForce 6200, which is a card that performs dramatically better with new shader effects and gains back the compression technologies, giving it a huge advantage even in cases where it has less memory bandwidth. That might be something to explore in the future. So with that, I hope you all enjoyed this take on vintage budget graphics cards. And for more on retro graphics card content, you know who to look for. Thanks for watching. I'm Nathan, and this has been Pixel Pipes.